long, long day, and we have two more. Fortunately, the talks are also fascinating. I think we're all up for more. And uh, so with this, this talk here, I want to in introduce uh, Zachary Kohlberg, who is a uh, marine biologist, uh, evolutionary biologist, uh, many things, interested in the evolution of consciousness and neurotransmitter systems and looking at sponges as a model for this. And as it turns out, sponges have very interesting chemistry. So I will leave it at there and let him talk about his work. Zach, welcome. So we're starting a little bit late. At the very end, I wanted to talk about future projects. So I'm just going to mention briefly now that in the next month or so, I'm planning on moving to Indonesia to work with a large pearl oyster farming company. So we'll have access to about 20 sites across Indonesia. And they'll let me gather all of the sponges and coral that are growing on the pearl farm rope infrastructures and garden them outside with other communities. So we can do restoration projects, polyculture, uh, try to bring back some of the habitat for uh, fish spawning aggregation. And uh, maybe I'll be able to touch on that a little bit more by the end of all the slides. I just added a few more, um, so I'm worried about not getting to the end here. Okay. So, title here, Farming Psychedelics and Other Tryptamine Medicines from Marine Sponges, Yielding, uh, Yield Enhancing Lessons from Silicon. Um, here we go. So one of the studies I read about in some book on mushrooms at some point uh, was by uh, Gartz, where he fed uh, psilocybe mushrooms with tryptamine and increased the amount of psilocin. And I, I thought, hey, this would be great to apply to other organisms as well. Uh, so he, he fed tryptamine and he fed 4-hydroxy, uh, no, he fed N-N-diethyl tryptamine to the mushrooms and increase the yields by over here, that's like 330%, or no, 330 times. So I thought that's significant, that's a pretty cool technique. And we could probably not only look for increasing the amount of compounds that are produced, but also look at uh, which proteins or uh, transcripts for proteins are there and get an idea of how to uh, maybe engineer another microorganism to produce the same things with the same transcripts. Uh, he showed that there was a lot of psilocin produced, not so much psilocybin. And he showed that tryptophan didn't work nearly as well as tryptamine. Um, he showed that NN-diethyltryptamine got hydroxylated a whole bunch. And then there are other minor products, but those were the big ones. So I thought, hey, tryptamine hydrochloride, that would be great to feed to some other organisms that produce tryptamine derivatives. And I, I thought after years of studying organic chemistry, it would be a lot easier to have an organism manufacture chemicals and extract them rather than design synthetic roots. Um, so this is a conference on ethnopharmacology. And honestly, there are not people out there taking sponges as psychedelics. So it's a little different. Uh, I thought it was interesting maybe to go around studying people who study compounds from sponges. So I have been around the world talking to professors of marine natural product chemistry. But I thought I'd throw this in because I've seen it now and again. The soporific sponge, which was used from the 9th to 14th centuries. And it was doped with opium, hashish, mandrake, hemlock, henbane, black nightshade, and inserted into the nostrils for anesthesia for surgeries. Uh, I think we should bring that back. <laughs> uh, maybe we should dope it with some psychoactive compounds from sponges. And sponges were also wet with, uh, I, I believe, ether and used in an inhaler over there, which was new to me. I mean, I think I just saw that one a couple nights ago, but I was trying to find some information on soporific sponges for you. That was mostly uh, in Europe and the Middle East. Um, so I've, I've got this passion for structures, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit more. Uh, one of the things I came upon, too, looking at neurochemistry, 
was that you've got serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline all produced by the same enzyme, which is aromatic L amino acid decarboxylase, or also dopa decarboxylase. And just by this enzyme, well, and a couple others, you have psychoactivity on all of these receptors, the GPCR receptors here, dopamine receptors, serotonin receptors, norepinephrine, epinephrine. And then they're basically all degraded by monoamine oxidase. And something interesting about that too is that all of these aromatic rings make these compounds fluorescent. So they emit you know, a lower wavelength light. Whereas monoamine oxidase is a flavin cofactored enzyme and flavin absorbs and emits light as well. And I'm thinking like in the origin of these chemicals before consciousness, maybe there was some light interaction with matter and there was some consciousness that emerged from interacting with light in the depths of the ocean, not so deep. Okay, so uh, Alexander Shulgin and Anne published, uh, wrote TCAL and PCAL. Um, and basically, they're all about their books about tryptamine derivatives and phenethylamine derivatives. And Sasha, uh, he joked that they, maybe one day there would be a HECAL, a histamine, um, histamines I've known and loved. Um, but that never came out. So I loved looking through these books and flipping through to figure out uh, which compounds were more psychoactive and what, what the patterns were. Uh, the first time I started looking at structures, I was actually doing a report on cancer from electromagnetic frequencies. And there was some article I read saying that melatonin production was inhibited by EMFs. And then I looked up the structure of melatonin. I'd never done that before. And right next to it was DMT. And the picture caption said Ralph Metzner. And we happened to buy our house from Mal Ralph Metzner. So I thought that was really interesting. And I started reading about DMT. Um, at some point, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas came out, and there's that scene uh, where Hunter S. Thompson's taking adrenochrome. And I read about adrenochrome, did a report at UC Berkeley, and found that there was some research by Smithies, Humphrey, o uh, Osmond, and Hoffer in Canada. And they thought that the structure of adrenochrome was related to the structure of mescaline, and that this pink spot in schizophrenic urine was causing schizophrenia. It just happened to be that they kept the schizophrenic urine longer and it oxidized and it wasn't related to the compound. But I started looking at similarities and structures. Um, so reading through uh, the Shulgin's book, looking at MDA and a couple of other compounds like mescaline, DOM, which has got a methyl group here at the four position, and DOE, which was more active, I wondered why they never turned this oxygen over here into a carbon. And finally, I met Sasha Shulgin, and he said, well, you should talk to David Nichols about dragonfly. And I thought I was on to something looking at the structure activity relationships. I loved doing this. So here is the Mind States Conference in 2001, and I got to meet Sasha and Anne. Uh, so Sasha wrote about sponges, because there was a brominated tryptamine from a sponge, and he produced it too. There was five, well, we'll get to it in the next slide. He said, I had the fantasy of trying to scotch the rumor I'm about to start that all the hippies of the San Francisco Bay Area were heading to the Caribbean with packets of zigzag papers to hit the sponge trade with a psychedelic fervor. I'm from the Bay Area. <laughs> so I don't go to the Caribbean. I go to Indonesia and to Japan. Um, so these are the structures that he talked about, 5-bromo-DMT, 5-6-dibromo-DMT, 5-6-dibromo-tryptamine, and 5-6-dibromo-N-methyltryptamine. Then here's another paper showing, uh, you need to think a couple different ways if you're going to study psychedelics in Japan and Indonesia or Singapore. Uh, so they also have anti-cancer activity, their antibiotic and anti-inflammatory properties. So I've, I've had to be pretty careful about the way I phrase my research and I don't go about saying, hey, psychedelics. I say, you know, serotonergic agonists um, and indoles and tryptamines with antiviral properties. But it's more than just that they're psychoactive. They have got other properties. And it, it's so important to look for new medicines, especially in the ocean, 
And since we've only had scuba diving around for a century, um, this is really a much newer avenue than talking to shamans and a good opportunity to find new medicine. So I haven't personally found a new psych psychotropic substance from a sponge. I've got LCMS data. Um, I've designed studies. But I want to give you three kind of types of psychedelics from the sea to tell you that they are there. Some of them can be pretty easily found. They're all over the place. Uh, this is about aplysinopsins. So aplysinopsins here uh, have another uh, cyclic system, which is basically, to me, it looks kind of like urea is bound with tryptophan, and you've got it methylated. You find these all over the place in uh, sponges. You can find them in coral. Um, they found that a dinoflagellate also produces them. Um, and here's a paper on structure activity relationships. What's kind of important is deciphering. I don't talk much about 5-HT1A. I'm more interested in 5-HT2A uh, and 2C. 2C is not so much psychedelic as it has some physiological properties, like it induces lordosis in mice, which is like uh, mating behavior during estrus. And uh, there are other properties of serotonin that cause spawning. And I think that's more important when you get into growing marine organisms. Um, it can induce spawning in, I believe, oysters or uh, another marine shellfish. Uh, they did find that there was a preference like 1,400-fold for 5,6-dichloro uh, um, aplysinopsin. And this double bond over here, uh, coming off of the indole in the three position, that causes it to have a strong preference for 5-HT2C. So all over nature you find, or in the sea, mostly this guy over here, which is uh, six bromo, uh, it's a dimethyl aplysinopsin with that double bond coming off of the three position. And another type of psychoactive compound coming from sponges are baretin and 8,9-dihydroberetin. So this is a cyclic dipeptide formed out of arginine, the amino acid arginine, and the amino acid uh, tryptophan. And over here... In baretin, you've got a double bond, which causes preference for the 5-HT2C receptor over the 5-HT2A. Um, this is found from Geodia uh, baretti, which was worked on by uh, Swedish researchers, and this is like a deep sea sponge. So that's more evidence of psychedelics and sponges. And then before we talked about the dimethyltryptamines, the 5-bromo dimethyltryptamine and the 5,6-dimethyl-dibromo-dimethyltryptamine. Uh, uh, so now I'm going to go on mostly about farming sponges and accessing sponges. And right here, I was telling you that you've got to think about things in a different way in order to study the compounds in Asia. So some of the compounds are psychedelic. Some are antiviral. Some are anti-cancer. Some are antibacterial. Some are antifungal. And sometimes they share properties. So it can be pretty important to look at the shared properties and exclude the part about them being psychedelic when you're proposing research. Um, but it clearly indicates the importance of the marine environment for creative solutions to human health and ecological health. You can also think a, a lot of these compounds are antiviral, and they're also helping with the marine ecosystem by preventing viral infections. They're probably also inducing spawning in the fish around them and other marine critters. There's a reason they're there. So I got to start a PhD program in Japan at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, where I collected sponges from a pearl farm. I got to do a transcriptome sequencing uh, the mRNA and LCMS looking at the chemicals in there. And I got to feed them tons of different precursor chemicals including tryptophan, phenylalanine, uh, malonic acid, which induces a polyketide synthase um, activity, but not in sponges. It induces it in bacteria. And a transcriptome, the way I did it, you couldn't sequence um, the mRNA transcripts from microbes because they're a bit different than eukaryotes. These are four of the sponges that cultured well. And I'm going to get to this later. I got to farm about 
I left 400 cuttings of sponges growing when I left Japan. The core of many bioactive sponge alkaloids are composed of tryptamines, indoles, and phenethylamines, and a lot of the time there is bromine. You've already seen that. Bromine makes it easier to, uh, to find a brominated compound in a mass spec because it's got dual peaks, because the isotopes of bromine are 79 and 81. So you'll find two peaks for something that's brominated. So you can look through an LCMS and go like, ooh, there's a brominated compound, um, which is nice. And then I'm going to gonna get to another part about fluorescence and um, aromatic uh, alkaloids. So here I start uh, going into the directed transformation like what uh, Gartz did with the tryptamine and the fungi. Um, I applied it to an assortment of marine sponges in an attempt to uh, increase production of alkaloids. Yes, I also, I also fed them dopamine, uh, glutamate, and GABA. Sponges don't have a nervous system, they don't have a heart, but they've got a protosynapse. They've got a lot of the architecture of a synapse, of a neuron. So where did neurons come from and what were neurotransmitters doing before there were neurons? And that's, that's a question I love to ponder. I did try feeding them dopamine, but it oxidizes and turns black immediately. It's not so easy to work with. Um, there are a few FDA-approved drugs from the sea. The first antiviral compound was actually from uh, the sponge Tethia crypta off the coast of Florida, which produced um, ERA, a, uh, also known as Viderabin. Um, it's kind of moved off the market because it has bad side effects, but it was there, and some of the, um, some of the antivirals developed thereafter were based on the structure. Um, Halavin, I'm going to go into this more. Halavin is an anti-breast cancer drug developed from a derivative of halochondrin B uh, from a sponge halochondria okadai uh, in Japan. This is really what started my interest in marine natural products. I was taking a synthetic or organic uh, graduate level course at UC Berkeley from Dirk Trauner who did a complete stereoselective synthesis of morphine and one of the compounds he presented in class for uh, synthesis was halochondrin B. So a couple years later, my father died. No, my father died a couple months later. And I was thinking maybe neurochemistry isn't the best application of my interest. Maybe I should look into anti-cancer drugs or drugs for other, you know, other kinds of medicine. Eventually in 2004, I was offered an opportunity to go on board the RV Heraclitus in the South Pacific and I had to write an essay and I thought, okay, I'm going to talk about the importance of new drugs from the sea. And that got me on board the ship. I went over to uh, Harvard University for 15 minutes to talk to Yoshido Kishi, who did the complete synthesis of halochondrin B. And he said, go to Okinawa and study palytoxin from palithoa. And 2012 came around. That was 2004, and I did. I got into a PhD program to study exactly that. And then I was headed off to uh, University of Utah, and he said, talk to Chris Ireland. And Chris Ireland had worked on a project with Cone Snail, Conus Magus, uh, to produce W, oh, sorry, what is that? Well, it's, it's one of the conotoxins. Um, it wasn't him that discovered the conotoxin, but he was working with that, University of Utah was. And this is a drug that's been approved for severe chronic pain um, through spinal cord injection. Then there's a company in Spain called Pharmamar, and they're a completely marine drug pharmaceutical company. They've got one drug on the market, Yondalise, for soft uh, tissue sarcoma from a colonial sea squirt. I'm not going to pronounce that. Uh, the drug's called Trebectin. And something that's come along that's pretty interesting is that their drug Aplodin uh, for multiple myeloma from an ascidian uh, produces... Okay, plididepsin. Now, plididepsin, interestingly enough, was shown through molecular modeling, through, through docking studies and silico studies, to be like 27 times more potent than remdesivir, which was emergency approved for coronavirus over, over the course of the last couple of years. So it was even more powerful than the drug that was approved. Moving on. Um, there are a whole bunch of other antiviral drugs. Uh, they're kind of on the forefront for research. Uh, Hamagarin B, brominated, manzamine, indole, uh, 
dragomycin and F brominated indole, and 4 methyl uh, aptamine, which has got uh, adrenergic A1 activity, and it's an antiviral. So, one of the sponges I've been growing, Aptos Aptos, probably, uh, produces aptamine. It's probably one of the things I could grow and make money off of. But it, uh, the synthesis is probably relatively easy, though. It's a small molecule. Uh, manzamine, too. There are a whole bunch of compounds from Okinawa that were named after the location they were found. Manzamine uh, was found at Manzamo Cliff. I've got a picture of that. Here I am at Manzamo Cliff, shaped like an elephant, and Manzamine A. Now, Manzamine A has got a whole lot of different activities. It's antiviral, anti-cancer as well, and uh, it's active against malaria. So this is me before I got into the PhD program in, in Japan, just looking around, beautiful island, beautiful place. Uh, so the sponge incubation treatments. Um, I did get to identify what these sponges are um, recently with UCSF uh, San Francisco. So we got to sequence the 28S uh, DNA and the 16S DNA, which means I got to profile what the sponges were and what all the microbes were. And then we got to sequence all the DNA in a metagenome, and we're still trying to put together the sequences and annotate them. Uh, for these sponges, I treated them with tryptophan and potassium bromide and tryptamine and potassium bromide. I was not able to get LCMS data. The professor I was working with wanted me to do NMR, which is kind of useless if you can't um, get the single chemical by itself. So it was pretty frustrating. I wanted just to do LCMS. That would have been, I would have been able to prove what was going on much easier, but there was an even easier way to show that something was happening. So this is thin layer chromatography uh, TLC, where you spot your extract, and then you run it with a solvent on a stationary phase, and it separates out the chemicals. And you can see under UV light, these are very fluorescent. And like I was mentioning, indoles and uh, phenethylamines, they are fluorescent. So you can see that there is pronounced uh, production of a few chemicals, not just one, and it wasn't just the tryptamine, it wasn't just the tryptophan, a whole bunch of stuff was being produced. I can't tell you what the molecular weights are, it's not LCMS, but I can tell you that it was producing some compounds. Then another thing you can do is, instead of just putting a little spot down, you spot the thing across the whole TLC card and run in the solvent and then you get these lines, and you can scratch off the whole line. It's called preparatory TLC, and extract that, and then you can run a mass spec on it. Pro the prof I was working with wouldn't let me do that. He showed me that's what you do. He wouldn't let me do it, so I didn't get to identify all of these lines. You can see there are multiple compounds produced. And I was going to mention, like I was saying before about fluorescence, I think it's pretty interesting that serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline, uh, they used to treat neurons with formaldehyde. Um, there's uh, a process by Falk and Hillerp where they showed that you can make the neurons fluoresce that have serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline with the treatment of formaldehyde. And we got to visualize the brain a lot more because of this. Fluorescence is important. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about how my journey progressed. Um, First off, I used to work in a nursery back home, and there was a woman, Mary Allen, that I worked with, and her mother was engaged to Linus Pauling, and she used to tell me about the engagement and her mother, and she used to wear a nitroglycerin uh, pill around her neck, and she'd tell me about digitoxin uh, produced by uh, Digitalis, by Foxglove, and I thought that was so cool, and she got me interested into uh, Ethno, ethnobotany, and she had another guy living with her, and he showed me TCAL and PCAL. Um, so, yeah, based on, P <laughs> he also told me to go to UC Berkeley and study with David Presti, so I did. That's where I was studying adrenochrome, or I wrote a paper on it. Then I took uh, Tom Carlson's course. Um, some of you know Tom Carlson. Um, and Dirk Trauner. Uh, told me about halochondrin B. I got on board the RV Heraclitus. Um, there was Laser and Gay on board that uh, were in the Biosphere 2. 
And one of the take homes from Biosphere 2 was that if that's a model for how the world works, the first thing in the health of the ecosystem to go is the coral reef. And that's what Gaid put together. Um, she told me to go to school in Singapore and New Zealand, and I did. Um, I went to visit, as I mentioned, um, Yoshida Kishi at Harvard, who told me to go study Palithoa in Okinawa, and I did. And I talked to Chris Ireland, who told me to get the Marine Natural Product Reviews and a book called Drugs from the Sea. So I got those. I took those on board RV Heraclitus, and I sailed from Samoa to Tokelau to Kiribati to Tuvalu to Fiji, got kicked off the boat in Fiji went to Vanuatu, and then by the pool, I was talking to a couple of people, and they said, well, what do you want to do with your life? I said, I want to go finish my degree in New Zealand. They're like, what are you doing here? Get out of here. Buy your ticket today. So I bought the ticket there, and then I went interviewing all the professors that are editors for the Marine Natural Product Reviews at different universities in New Zealand, all of the editors for the Marine Natural Product Review detailing all the new uh, chemicals from the sea. They're all from New Zealand, and I wanted to go to university. University of Christchurch, um, that Canterbury, University of Canterbury in Christchurch. But basically all these professors say we got no money, there's no room in the lab. Um, eventually Brent Kopp gave me a tip to go work with a marine microbial ecologist at University of Auckland, uh, which I did a, a couple of years later while I was trying to work with Phil Cruz, who is a big marine natural product chemist at UC Santa Cruz. I went and loaded up on all the Wade Davis books I could uh, before I got on board as well. And I thought, okay, I'm going to be kind of like a Wade Davis from the sea. Um, after I finished my undergraduate in marine toxicology at UC Santa Cruz while I was studying abroad at Singapore, I got into a master's program in New Zealand. I was going to study with Mike Taylor. Um, he was really much more interested in studying the phylogeny of marine microbes rather than active metabolism. I wanted to study drugs from the sea. But he, he profiles microbial communities. It wasn't going to work, and it was going to put me in debt. So I was looking for other projects, and I found this uh, taxonomist that works on sponges in like the most uh, biodiverse areas uh, for marine biodiversity in Indonesia. There was an open project, and I say, hey, can I join? And they said, yeah. And I got there, and she said, sorry. So I got stranded in Borneo. And I ended up living in Indonesia for five years, trying to find sponges. So that was Nicole Devu. She's the, she's the expert on marine uh, sponge taxonomy in <coughs> Indonesia. She co-published with Junichi Tanaka. That's the professor that I worked with in Okinawa, Japan. So I, I ran out of all my money after working as a manager on a pearl farm, and I ended up uh, spending the last of my money to go to Okinawa to go talk to Junichi Tanaka. And he told me, go to this other university. They've got a lot of money. We got no money. So I applied, and I was the first year student, first of 34 students to get accepted. We met the emperor of Japan and the empress, and there were like eight Nobel laureates on the board. Um, I worked for Atlas South Sea Pearl in Raja Ampat, Indonesia, which is the number one marine biodiverse place on the planet. And while I was working at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology and uh, University of Ryukyu, I, I worked on the Ryukyu Shinju Pearl Farm that had been around since like 1953. So they let me use all the infrastructure. That means that I don't have to go find uh, dive gear. I don't have to find dive boats. I don't have to find a, a map to where I'm diving at. They, they've got all of the infrastructure. You don't start from zero. You start from an industry that's already functioning. Um, this is palytoxin, a very complicated toxin from palythoa. This is the most toxic compound produced from the sea. And this is the project I was put on uh, for the PhD program. This over here is palythoa. It's like a rubbery coral. And yeah, there, there's information about lots of, pe lots of people dying from handling this in aquariums. And there was, where it was discovered and worked on in Hawaii, the research facility burnt down. It's just part of the story. It's kind of a wacky story. Um, so I got on board uh, the RV Heraclitus. Like I mentioned, we went all around the South Pacific. I got to see firsthand what the sponges were. It wasn't just reading. I wasn't stuck in Utah, which was nice. I'm from San Francisco, not from Utah. But you can imagine, like, why do they have natural marine natural product chemists in Utah? You probably want to get out of there, probably. 
so this was Drugs from the Sea by uh, Fusatani, which was recommended, read that aboard. And then, like I mentioned, the Marine Natural Product Review, every year this editorial board puts out a list of all the compounds that are discovered every year. And while I'm looking at these compounds, I realize, oh, look, are all the alkaloids you got, all the tryptamines, you've got ergot alkaloids. Um, so this is from Marine Natural Product Reviews 2005. You can see sponges, 247 of the new compounds come from sponges, way more than anything else. So that's why I thought I'm going to study sponges. That's what, you know, was the motivation there. Um, uh, you got iodinated tryptophan over here, brominated uh, tryptamines over here, uh, brominated beta-carboline, beta sorry, uh, brominated phenethylamine, brominated pyrrol, beta-carbolines, pyrrol, phenethylamines. Whole bunch of interesting alkaloids, that's the point. And I would go through that just like I would thumb through PCAL and TCAL. Uh, Marinlet is a database put together by Blunt and Monroe from University of Canterbury where they take everything that's been published in the Marine Natural Product Reviews and they put it into a database. And that way you can get mass spec uh, data on your natural product extract and say, oh, the mass spec like, M over Z matches with the number from this database. Maybe it's this sponge or if you look up the sponge that you have based on a taxonomist identifying it, you can say, oh, these are all the compounds known to be produced by this sponge. It's a great database. There's also one called uh, Antimarin. Um, so it's really nice to have access to an LCMS and this database at the same time. I never got to have both of those at the same time, and that's frustrating. Um, this is a bit out of order, sorry. Uh, when I got off of the Heraclitus in the South Pacific, I went to Vanuatu and I tried to find somebody that studied medicine from the sea. So I found Alice over here and she studied uh, medicine from seaweed. And one time she, she told me, it's not really about what you give people from the sea, it's all about love. Sometimes love heals people. Um, so... <laughs> All right, I played in the 2005 Tokelau National Games because I got stuck there. And they're like, hey, as long as you're here, you should run the 400 meter run and play rugby. <laughs> uh, so I did. Uh, I made balloon animals. I was a clown for a couple of years. That's how I supported myself at Berkeley. <laughs> really good at balloons. Uh, Sasha and Anne didn't have very good memories, but I just tell them I'm the guy that makes you the balloon molecules. Um, so, I've been working in these areas. This is basically where the ship went around. These are all the universities in New Zealand. This is where the pearl farm was. These are some projects for growing coral in Bali and Yili Trawangan, Lombok, Flores, Indonesia. Um, some of the sites that I went up uh, to see in the mountains of Kalimantan and Borneo, uh, University of Singapore, National University of Singapore. I'm about to, in, in the next month, uh, be located over here in northern Maluku, um, Moratai. Uh, we've, they're going to have 20 sites all across Indonesia. I'm super excited for an opportunity to sample and culture sponges from all over. And then over here, this was uh, the universities in Japan and Okinawa, and then the sites where I was collecting and farming sponges. Uh, I also I worked with... Um, Udayana University in Bali, when I would get my sponge samples in Indonesia, we'd extract them there uh, and then dry them up. And then working with them, we got to do bioassays on um, uh, shrimp uh, hatching. Shrimp egg hatching, we'll get there. Um, I want to throw this in, just in terms of ethnopharmacology. Th this is um, an anthropologist from MIT who wrote a book on people who drug study microbes from the sea, and it's a really interesting read talking about all the people that study marine microbes. Some of them are people that study drugs from the sea, some of them are just microbial ecologists, but I thought I'd throw that in there. Um, so working on pearl farms, pearl farms have all this infrastructure. They've got kilometers. I've been out in that part of the world, so I say kilometers now. Uh, they've got 
tons and tons of ropes and floats and a lot of stuff grows on that and you can plant stuff on it. So one of the things that I got to see was that coral grows all over um, the anchor lines and you can, you normally break it off just so it doesn't weigh down the pearl farm in infrastructure uh, and then you throw it away, it dies. So I thought, hey, let's plant this stuff. And that's one of the things I'm looking forward to doing. But you get um, small boats, you get dive teams that can work with you. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm gonna put this project together and I'll be able to uh, farm coral and other things with people and draw in teams and you know find an eccentric philanthropist. Um, so here is me with the dive team at Raja Ampat. They were really sad to see me go. Uh, we, we dove and collected sponges to culture uh, 20 to 25 meters. A lot of sponges just don't grow though. They're just soft and you gotta use a very sharp knife. Uh, you don't want as much tissue damage, then you got to figure out what size to grow them. These are the sponges out of 81 samples that gave really toxic uh, extracts for uh, brine shrimp hatching assays. Uh, this is Pak Tut, who helped me extract everything. One time there was an earthquake, and a lot of the bottles fell and broke, and he was so sad. He was like, boss, boss, I'm so sorry. It wasn't his fault. It was... He's a good guy. I really like working with him. Um, these are uh, the extracts over here. Then I got three master's students. Was it three? Three master's student and one student had already graduated um, to extract everything for me and run the bioassays. Um, they were really nice, but they published all the work without telling me. Um, I worked with an electrical coral reef um, uh, operation called BioRock, uh, which is all around Indonesia. It works effectively for giving a substrate to grow things on up out of the sediment. I can't tell you what the electricity actually does, but it, it accretes minerals and the structure gets much more solid, whereas just iron rusts away in the sea. I can't argue about that. There are other things I can argue about in terms of what the electricity does, and it's not helpful. So um, I did get an opportunity to harvest a lot of sponges. Some of them were encrusting sponges that grow over coral. Some of them were not. But it gave me a good opportunity to collect things, to work with this coral reef uh, growing project. And it taught me about how to grow coral reef and polyculture. So this is also me working with another coral culture project, but this is for um, uh, a business. They sell this coral. Um, it's $10 per piece of coral, 100 pieces per square meter. That's $1,000 per square meter. It's pretty good. Um, this is the project I did in Okinawa for the PhD program. I didn't finish the PhD program, um, but I, as I was saying, I fed the sponges tryptophan, phenylalanine, glutamate, GABA, dopamine, malonic acid, glucose, and sodium bromide. I got the LCMS. This sponge doesn't happen to produce alkaloids for the most part. What it did seem to produce a lot of is something called a diketopiprazine, which is two amino acids joined together, a cyclic dipeptide. And actually, the one from tryptophan seems to have activity against uh, SARS COVID. Um, I also found from sequencing the mRNA that there was a transcript for indole ethyl amine and methyl transferase, which would be what produces DMT. Why, why would it need that? Um, here is a map of Ryukyu Shinju in Irimote, Japan, which is very close to the most southern island in Japan, which is Hateruma. Um, Irimote is gorgeous. They say that the people live to be centurions there more often than anywhere in the world. Uh, beautiful bay, the people are super nice. I would have loved to keep working there. My grant only lasted for um, a year and nine months. Um, so these are the sponges that got collected and that grew this one over here. I'm gonna talk about what they actually are because now we have DNA sequences which I can um, submit to a database and figure out the closest organisms, they're not 100%. So all I can say is these are closely related to other organisms, and then I can do literature reviews on them. Um, so these are all the dive sites. This is me measuring the sponges. I measured the growth and survival for a few months. 
Um, I'll talk about each of these ones specifically. This over here on the left, though, is a bath sponge. So maybe we could, you know, put some interesting chemicals in that and sell them to put up your nose. Um, one over here, B. I thought that was called Hirtios erectus, which is known to produce uh, dimethyltryptamines and aplysinopsins. Turns out it wasn't, but it was a, another sponge that does produce those. Probably. It's related. Aptos produces the adrenergic agonist that's also antiviral. Uh, D uh, produces uh, some compounds that are effective in epigenetics uh, against blocking some acetylation, I believe, and, and methylation. And then the last one over there uh, is a Michele that grows on the sponge lines. It grows to be meters and meters and meters. So that's what I use for uh, doping the sponge for repeatability because I knew it was the same organism, but it's not known to produce alkaloids. It's known to produce similar genus, uh, similar organisms in the genus are known to produce antiviral compounds and they've been farming those in New Zealand. Um, so here is a phylogenetic tree showing the five sponges and the two closest hits uh, in DNA matching. Um, and I got to finally look up some publications on the chemistry of the closely related sponges. Only one of them was probably exactly the same. The Aptos Aptos was that uh, orange-red one, C. Um, some of these I can pronounce and some that I can't. Um, so I think that for the next few slides I show chemicals produced by the similar sponges. Um, so this is the spongia. This is the bath sponge. It was closely related to uh, Rhodoplades adorable, which is farmed as a bath sponge. Um, Duckworth, who works in New Zealand, farmed this. Uh, and Spongia, over to the right, Spongia matamata. There's some literature reviews uh, containing information on compounds produced by Spongia matamata, but they're not alkaloids, so I'm like, whatever. Um, sponged B, which I thought produced some psychedelics, was related to uh, Thorectandra excavates, and that has this brominated aplysinopsin here. And what it does that's interesting is it cuts the uh, cyclic, uh, the heterocycle with the nitrogen of, uh, of indole and splits it open. Uh, so it's basically an aplysinopsin where the indole ring has been uh, cut open. And over here you can see that there are these dual peaks at the bottom. Um, 39 and 41, that's two apart. That's showing a mass spec value for the bromine that's on the compound, which I mentioned before is important because you can find brominated compounds with mass spec. Um, another closely related sponge was the Fax aplysinopsis reticulata. And you've got a whole bunch of aplysinopsins produced over here. A lot of them are oxygenated. Then you've got over here, uh, Let's see the two methyl groups and the two bromines. So you've got a phenethylamine, a brominated phenethylamine. You've got um, a dimer of that. And we got a lot more sponges to go through. Aptos aptos, very similar to this uh, sponge C. Uh, you produce all these aptamines, as I mentioned, adrenergic ag uh, agonist and antiviral. And then also related to Neopetrosia exigua doesn't really produce any interesting alkaloids. And this sponge, Pseudoceratina arabica, is closely related, which makes these brominated tyrosine derivatives, which have activity on epigenetic type mechanisms. And then it's very closely to, related to Varangula rigida, which produces brominated uh, DMT and uh, brominated aplysinopsins, and that's exciting. It produces quite a bit of it. That sponge, I believe, is found off the coast of Florida, though. So it's someplace in the middle. Uh, it also produces a compound called macaluvamine, but I think you should say it macalovamine. <laughs> and then the last sponge it was a mycale related to these two, compound, these two sponges here, which aren't known to produce interesting compounds, but it is related to Michaela Henschelai, which is farmed in New Zealand for these antiviral compounds. And where are we going now? So another thing is that some of these compounds have a value on the market, but it's usually as a reference compound. So they are very high priced, but it's not like anybody needs to buy a kilogram of a very high priced reference. 
So it looks like most of the market is to say, hey, do you have a reference so I can test one milligram? And then, you know, one milligram costs a couple hundred dollars. So then you get things that cost like a billion yen. Sorry, this is all in yen. I did this when I was in Japan. Um, so take off two zeros there. Uh, so swinholide A, aptamine, manoalide, aeroplacinin, one, manzamine, heteronemin, metachromin A. Metachromin A actually is an antiviral that uh, they've recently found, I believe, uh, effective against HIV. Effective, it, it works. There's some biases showing that it's antiviral. At the time that I thought I had this, uh, there was no research on it. Heteronemin, we know, I'm pretty sure that was in one of the sponges. There's no market value for it. Manzamine A might be able to be produced by a, a microbe, and most likely there's a lot of it to be harvested from sponges in northern, uh, in northern Indonesia, where I will be. So it could be part, uh, I, I would bet that I could make some money off of farming the sponge that produces aptamine and manzamine A. Um, we'll see what else is out there. There's always swinholide A. It's a uh, very easy uh, sponge to find. Um, I didn't mention the sponge. It's it, escaping my mind right now. Uh, Theonella swinhoi. So these, this is some data of my sponge farming experiments in Okinawa. Um, I tried in bait cages, nets, uh, pearl net, thread, uh, white net, wire loops. Got some data on what survived. Um, altogether, I was mentioning that at the end of this year and a half of culturing sponges, there are about 400 sponges that were still there. And there are replicates in case I wanted to go back and do research and uh, study the exact same organism. Um, this is some of the sponge, this is some of the coral, sorry. Usually it grows on the coral, uh, on the pearl ropes like this, and then it's just broken off and dropped into the ocean like I mentioned. So I said, hey, don't do that, let's culture it. So I grabbed a bunch of it and I put wire on it and attached it to the ropes that normally grow the pearl oysters, and it all survived. I put it on another structure, it descended. Uh, I started trying to figure out what would be the best way to do a large scale project, and I thought, well, we should make like these superstructures where you have small structures, you combine them all so they're easy to carry, easy for one person to work with rather than getting like eight people to haul one out and you can't fit many on a boat. So I was saying, let's make these superstructures out of like hexagonally woven rebar, put them all together and, you know, um, rehabilitate large areas of coral for fish spawning aggregation. So these are a whole bunch of different techniques for growing coral. This is over here on the left is the technique uh, used for commercial mariculture of coral that made money. This is the electrical coral reef bio rock in the middle. Over on the right is when I tried to make a bio rock, it worked. And then a hanging in basket mechanism uh, method for it in Akajima, uh, southern Okinawa, Japan. All of these actually on the bottom are from Okinawa, Japan. One works with a power company. The others are called uh, from a place called Sea Seed, which just plants coral on a coast, and they have like running mariculture tanks on the coast. They also plant in the water. Um, the largest coral reef restoration project uh, is the Hope Reef project off the coast of Sulawesi. And after I proposed, and I wrote, I wrote like. Um, a, Mac, a, uh, a mock patent about this, um, uh, proposed making small hexagonal um, coral reef restoration uh, structures and making them stackable and able to form a superstructure. A couple of years later, I found that they were doing this uh, in southern Sulawesi, and it is the largest you know, coral reef restoration project in the world. So I, I still want to get my hands dirty in this and try the similar technique. Um, so we're, we're nearing the end here. Uh, my project now is going to be working with pearl farms to diversify farms where pearl oysters are grown. So I'm, uh, I, gave, I gave a webinar um, and I was contacted uh, after this webinar on diversifying pearl oyster farms. I was contacted by the CEO of a company with 20 farm sites. And they're like, we'd love to work with you. Um, so it looks like it's actually gonna work out. So I'm interested in growing sponges for extracts, 
uh, sponges for bath sponges. There's actually a market for menstrual products too, called sea pearls. Um, coral farming, coral restoration. Um, I was thinking we could take some of the seaweed and barnacles that grow on the oysters and are scraped off and ferment them and then use them for revegetating critical lands. Uh, you can also grow you know, fish on the farms and calerpa, um, which is another edible seaweed. Um, these are other things for polyculture, including lobster. I've got a friend that does lobster. Um, so I'm thinking the name of the company or the organization is going to be Oil of Tropic I Portfolio, like an investment portfolio. So it's a palindrome. And I, I've been writing palindrome poetry. You can talk to me later about that. Uh, was it as I saw it? I was, I sat, I saw. Um, so looks like I'm going to try to start a company at first. I'm just going to plant everything. Um, we'll apply me. I need people to help me. Apply for startup incubators. Uh, use the, the fouling that grows on the ropes. Um, use un, unused uh, infrastructure on the pearl farms to convert to polyculture. Uh, hopefully reduce the disease on the pearl farm by opening up um, the distance between things being cultured and some of the sponges should probably contribute antiviral uh, compounds into the ocean around it to take away some viral infections. There are herpes infections that infect oysters. Um, make money. Uh, use the coral reef that grows on the infrastructure to seed restoration projects around the area. And I'm really interested in using coral restoration to replace habitat that's been destroyed, where fishermen go to collect all the fish that are spawning. They usually, uh, they usually spawn on like the fringing reef outside of where the rivers are connecting in. They're bringing in all the algae, the nutrients. And without the spawning uh, habitat, maybe the fish don't spawn as much. So you know, I think it would be a, a great thing to do, restore the coral and bring back spawning aggregation habitat. A couple of the things that influenced that thought, too, were uh, natural capitalism. Um, someplace in that book, it says that the most valuable uh, natural resource is estuaries, where a lot of spawning occurs, and where the nutrients from rivers are entering into the sea. Uh, I wrote briefly uh, a, uh, an annual report for Rainforest Action Network, and it mentioned that deforestation contributes to sedimentation that kills the coral reef. So. They said that was the biggest impact that deforestation has. I thought, okay, I'll look into that. Um, as I've been mentioning, spawning aggregation, uh, predictable placement for uh, where spawning usually occurs, which is targeted by fishermen, work with that. Uh, I also mentioned that a lot of the compounds produced by the sponges have some preference for 5-HT2C, and I think that might be interesting in trying to induce spawning or, or look at... Um, you know, how to induce spawning in oysters or fish. Sometimes there are problems with the brood stock. They get stressed out and they don't produce offspring anymore. Um, and then compounds from the sponges to treat viral infections, which often occur in uh, hatcheries where they don't clean all the tanks very well. Uh, here's a picture of some spawning uh, aggregation uh, ideology. This is from, I think, the Coral Reef Research Foundation in Palau. There's uh, Patrick Collins there who's running the National uh, Cancer Institute's main natural product uh, repository in, uh, in Palau. They had decades and decades of marine natural product extracts and a drunk driver one night, while they were trying to transfer all the samples to the Smithsonian, ran into the facility and it exploded. They should make a movie. Um, that's what I got. These are my references. That was amazing, thank you. I was wondering what adrenochrome does in the body and when it's released? Um, it causes free radical cycling, which causes damage around the cell. But what's the function, like the good function of it? 
Oh, I don't think there is a good function. Oh, it's just bad. No, I, I think it's an oxidized side product of adrenaline. Uh, there's a dopachrome and uh, yeah, there are a few other aminochromes and they just tend to re-radical cycle. Okay, thank you. Come on. Any other questions? Hit me. All right. This is kind of unrelated, but since you seem to have read everything and everyone, um, have you ever read Lucia Shepard? No relation, by the way. A science fiction writer, he's sort of like the Philip K. Deck of the no. 90s. Anyway, he, he, there's a short story about a hallucinogenic coral, I think, and this weird sort of sci-fi Philip K. Dick coral psychedelic thing, which you might be interested in. Sure. Okay. Are there any? Are there any? Tubastria. Tubastria is a kind of coral that produces aplosynopsins, just okay. like the sponges. Because when I read it, I assumed it was a fictional thing. I never heard of a psychedelic coral. They do but produce I guess you're the guy to ask. Yeah. Okay. I, do you ha do you actually have evidence that those are psychedelics? Because it doesn't mean if they're 5 h 2 a agonists, it doesn't mean they're psychedelics. Right. We have evidence that 5,6-dibromo-dimethyltryptamine has been smoked and injected and is, uh, it is psychoactive. I talked to Morris Hamilton or Hamilton Morris the other day. He's tried it. Um, I don't know that uh, Baretin or um, the aplosynopsins have been consumed by humans. So, I mean, no. Uh, I don't want to smoke them, you know. I don't want to be in Japan or Indonesia uh, smoking sponges. You might not call it psychedelics, you know. No, it might not. It, it could be antagonists that bind more tightly as well, um, but there's affinity for those receptors. And I've been trying to talk to Brian Roth's lab for years. I tried to send all of my samples to him. I didn't have a National Institute of Health contract, so he wouldn't help me at that point. Um, I've got a friend, Mark Geyer, who just left uh, UC San Diego and, and has some different bioassays, most, mostly with uh, mice, though, and discrimination tests. Um, I'm trying to find other uh, bioassays to submit my samples to. I would love to have a bioassay to work with and LCMS. So if you can find anybody to buy me an LCMS and uh, a contract, let me know. Um, I'm kind of curious. Um, if you ever imagine that, you know, well, if your adrenochrome research was ever referenced by the QAnon people, and two, if you were how this how that thought story ended up in QAnon ever surprised you, or what, what do you make of that whole thing? The what? The hot or not? What? Do you know ad adrenochrome? Okay, I forgot to tell you a good story about this. <laughs> so on MySpace, I wrote that John Smithies, who'd worked on adrenochrome, was my hero. And then I got contacted one day saying, hey, I know you're a hero. Actually, out of, time? out of time. <laughs> okay. Um, I think uh, we need to move on to the next I was just, sorry, presentation. briefly, um, the granddaughter of John Smithies uh, okay. messaged me, and I got her tattooed with adrenochrome, and I got John Smithies to cry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you.